All right, so uh, this is a feature of um, uh, RBE services. Uh, everyone that I'm aware of implements this feature. Um, that includes BuildBuddy, BuildBarn, Engflow. Uh, Engflow is what we use at, at Canva, uh, and Stripe. Stripe is mentioned in some blog posts that they uh, implement this feature too. Uh, not everyone calls it deduplication. It's also called um, merging or coalescing. And as I was preparing to give this talk, I kind of regretted my choice to use the most difficult version to say, you know, merging is way easier, easier to say than deduplication. Uh, so the, the one sentence summary is that this uh, skips extra e execution requests for uh, actions that are already in flight, um, which is kind of a dense way to explain it. So let's, let's uh, walk through some examples. So uh, first, let's uh, see what happens when a user tries to build an action remotely. Um, first, uh, they send a request to the remote cache asking if there's a result already. Um, in this case, the action hasn't been run before, so there isn't. Uh, as a result, they send an execute request to the remote executor. Um, the action runs for a little bit. A result is written to the uh, remote cache, and then the build is finished. Um, let's compare that with what happens when two users try to run the same action at the same time. So let's skip ahead to the point where the action's already executing for that first user. Um, and introduce the second user. Uh, they send a request um, to the cache for the same action, but since this action is uh, still in progress on the remote executor, there isn't a result yet in the remote cache. So it's a cache miss, uh, and they send an identical execute request, and we run the action a second time. Um, I've used uh, remote execution here because that's, that's what I'm talking about, but this also applies um, to local execution if you've got um, two machines that are sharing a remote cache. Um, so by default, additional requests for uh, in-flight actions will be run um, again. Um, and both engineers need to wait uh, for the full um, duration of the action execution. And in this specific example, you spend twice as much money on compute. Uh, so let's see what happens when you have uh, action deduplication enabled on your um, RBE service. Uh, so we'll introduce a new component called the action registry. Uh, the implementation doesn't really matter. It's just a, a database that keeps track of which actions are in flight. Um, and rather than running the action directly, the um, executor first queries the registry to see if there's an instance of this action running. Um, there isn't, so we run it. Um, then the second user sends the same request, look, does a lookup in the registry, um, finds out that there is uh, an action running. Um, and so instead of running the action a second time, um, we just wait for the first uh, execution to finish. Um, so if you do this, you uh, save money because you're using less compute. You save time for that second developer because by the time they've sent their execution request, um, they, uh, you know, it's seconds or minutes into the execution of the first action. Um, but this example is um, completely contrived and uh, not particularly likely. It's not going to be super common that two engineers arrive at the same change at uh, the same time and fire off builds together. Um, so that, that example is not really worth optimizing for. So, but I'm not standing up here for no reason. Um, what is this actually useful for? Uh, and it shines in CI. And I want to put a particular emphasis on the integration part of CI, because at least at my job, CI is a shorthand for build kite build. Um, so, uh, yeah, two, two commits that um, pass individually when you're, when you're developing them. Um, after you merge them, they might break the build when they're built together. And this is a semantic conflict um, in contrast with a git conflict. Um, and you need some way to keep track of the red-green status of your main branch um, to, keep, you know, to find these um, semantic conflicts. Um, for example, if I make a, a change to a library function that's backwards incompatible, and even if I go and diligently update all the usages, um, and you independently have introduced a new usage of that old API, um, while those two builds might pass uh, individually on the, on the PRs, uh, once we merge our PRs, um, the master build will break. Um, a merge queue is an alternative to running builds on every commit on um, your main branch, but um, I definitely don't have time to talk about merge queues, so we'll pretend for the purposes of this talk that they don't exist. Um, so let's run through an example and see what happens when you merge a bunch of commits to, to your main branch. 
Um, and let's pretend that uh, our CI job is just a Bazel test of all the targets in our repo. So we've got this first target, which changes test one. Um, and our CI job fires off an execution of, the, of that test. And let's pretend that it takes 10 minutes. After it finishes, this second commit B lands on, on, this, on the main branch. Um, and since it has landed, after the test is finished, we've got a result in the action cache. And we don't need to run it a second time. Uh, but if instead B lands within that 10 minute window, there's not going to be a result in the uh, action cache yet. So you need to run it uh, a second time. And um, you double up on the, on the compute that you use. Uh, and it's not just going to be one extra execution. Uh, in our case, at, at the busiest time of day, there's about 43 commits that are landing in, a, in an hour between 2 and 3 PM Sydney time. So in a 10 minute window, that can be seven extra executions. Um, which is no good. Uh, but if you're using the duplication, you, you save a bunch of money on compute and um, you save time, especially for the uh, execution requests that arrive later. Uh, so some keen observers will, have the, will be asking why I'm running all of the targets in my repo. Why don't I just uh, try to build the targets that have changed? Um, like if each of these commits changed a different target, um, why don't I just compare with the previous commit in the main branch and build those targets that pop up? Um, you are free to do this, but I like my sanity, so uh, I don't do this. Um, uh, like, imagine if A broke test one, and uh, if, you, if you were just uh, executing the, the targets that um, are changed in a commit, you'd lose the ability to keep track of the status of, of test one. Like, did the revert work? Uh, did the, my attempt at a bug fix fix it? Um, you could build some infrastructure that let you track this, I think, but um, at least. Uh, by default, if you're scanning your like, list of builds, you're not going to see what's going on. Um, so what you have to do instead is you have to have some like, last well-known good commit that passed all the CI jobs and compare your current commit with that last good commit. And you end up in the same situation. We have to run the same test over and over again. Um, so even though we're run, executing a subset of the targets in the, in the repo, we still have to run test one a bunch of times because it's going to take some time for that. Uh, last good commit to, to uh, update. So yeah, you've, got, you've only got two options. If you want to stay sane, uh, you can build everything on every commit, which is simple but can be slower, or you can uh, build what's changed. Um, and uh, That can be faster, but um, it's not necessarily faster. Um, like Bazel diff sometimes isn't, isn't very fast, and it's definitely more complicated. Um, and in both cases, you have to deal with the, the, the like rebuilds. So uh, what results have we had with uh, action deduplication? We were in initially interested because of um, some particularly large web pack targets that were taking between seven and 10 minutes. And um, via some simulation, we've, we've, we've figured out that like 66%, two thirds of all of the builds that we were doing of these targets were uh, wasted because we had so many uh, commits landing in that 10 minute window. Um, but it, in practice, it, it's, it's nice, but it actually hasn't been a huge win, like on the order of maybe $10,000 of compute saved a year. Um, the real winner has been the UI tests, which are the tests that run against the output of those Webpack builds. Um, and that's because uh, there are thousands of these targets. Not, I've said hundreds here, but th really there are only like three Webpack builds that uh, are anywhere near that long. Um, and so with the UI tests, we get about half a million deduplications a day, which is crazy. Um, and if they, have an av they do have an average runtime of 100 seconds. Um, so it's like a year and a half of compute every day that's saved by this feature. Um, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in compute that we don't have to uh, rent from AWS. Um, so you and your team, if you're already using RBE, you, like I said before, everything, everyone implements this feature, so you're probably already using it. Um, if you don't, maybe this is something that you want to uh, take into account if you're weighing up whether or not you should migrate. Uh, particularly if you have a high commit rate, um, you do integrated main builds or you have a main, uh, merge queue, um, and if you have long running actions in the multiple minutes. Um, something to be aware of, though, is uh, the behavior of flaky tests if, you, if you're using action deduplication, um, because both failures and successes are amplified. Um, normally, uh, flaky failures are going to be nicely distributed throughout all the builds like this. Um, but if you're using deduplication, they might look a little more like this. Um, they're clustered together, because that first failure is the real execution, and the ones behind it are uh, deduplicated. Um, and so if you're like keeping track of flaky tests, uh, and you're alerting based on the hourly flake rate for some test target, um, and you have some alert threshold, 
normally when someone makes a change that makes the test more flaky, you can just, uh, if it goes beyond the threshold, you can just send them a Slack message, which they can ignore. And um, then uh, instead, if you have deduplication, um, even if the, the, the underlying flake rate is below your threshold, um, Again, this is like an extreme example, just to, but just to illustrate what I mean, um, these clusters are going to, these failures are going to be clustered together until you end up spamming them. Um, this is something we we're always aware of, but it's come up because we're rewriting some detection infrastructure recently. Uh, we, to be honest, we're not sure how to deal with it yet. Like, do we delay alerts? Uh, do we run stress tests before we send alert, send uh, messages? But um, if this is something that you've dealt with, uh, come and find me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you. And that's all. Thank you.